Let the light of your Holy Spirit penetrate the dark recesses of our hearts, that we may joyfully experience your presence in us, and be filled with the sweetness and strength of your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The late Bishop Sheen was very close to the sisters of the Holy Child, founded in Ireland in the middle of the last century by Mother Cornelia Connolly, the cause of whose beatification he promoted from the very earliest years of his priesthood. Some twenty years ago, the good bishop preached a retreat to Mother Connolly's sisters in their community house in Rye, in Westchester. Being the confessor of the community, I assisted with confessions during the retreat. And so it was my unexpected privilege to have dinner with the bishop two or three times during the retreat. We chatted at a number of things, Don Bosco too, and the Salesians, about whom he spoke admiringly. Bishop Sheen was one to put anyone at ease, so in the course of the conversation, I asked him a somewhat personal question. Bishop, how do you manage to be always so spontaneous and original when you speak in public? He replied, I try to ask myself what it is that I myself would need and want to hear on a given subject, and then I tell it the best way I can. His deep-set eyes sparkled, and he continued, I learned my lesson long ago that one cannot point the way to others unless he knows it well himself. He smiled and went on to tell this episode. As a young priest, <coughs> I was invited to preach a mission in Philadelphia. All I knew about the church was that it was not far from the station. So when I arrived, I spotted a youngster not more than eight or nine years old, bouncing a ball near the station. How about showing me what sacred our church is? I asked him. It is not far from here, Father, the youngster replied. It's my church. I'll take you there. But, Father, what would you be doing at sacred our church? I'll be there for a few days, and I'll preach a mission. What is a mission, Father? Well, I'm going to show the people the way to heaven. The boy was silent for a while. And then, but Father, he asked, how can you show people the way to heaven when you do not even know the way to the church? Well, I never did forget the story, and most of all, the way Bishop Sheen told it. Here I am preaching to you, supposedly pointing to you the way to holiness, when I am only too conscious of my own faltering steps, and too, incidentally, of my raspy voice and rusty English. So please bear with me in your kindness. Fortunately, there is a great deal more to a retreat than the sermons. I remember a confrayer of this province long since gone to his reward. A good Salesian he was, 
and a confirmed yoga. He sent me a postcard to Tampa, where I was at the time, from the retreat house. If this retreat, he wrote, is not a total disaster, it is because the cook is far better than the preacher. <laughs> In a more serious vein, and more apropos to our present discourse, are the words our great confrere, Venerable Bishop Garcilia, wrote to our provincial, who back in 1927 invited him to preach the retreats to our United States communities. I will be delighted to come, the bishop replied from China, and will consider it a privilege to share the Lord's gift with you. What he meant by the Lord's gift, he explained in his opening sermon. It is the gift of his word, the gift of his love, the gift of himself. There are no more than maybe three or four of us left in this province who were present at that retreat. Bishop Ursilia the man impressed us almost as much as his masterful talks. Some of us felt that we had among us a living example, if not to say a replica, of St. Francis de Sales. He even looked like St. Francis de Sales in his exterior figure. Most amiable, extremely self-effacing, approachable, and with a delightful sense of humor. But little did we know then that we had a living saint with us. Though an inkling of that I had a few days after the retreat. We were then at New Rochelle, which at that time, among other things, was also the novitiate. Someone decided the rickety bed of the bishop in the bishop's room should be replaced with a new one. The good bishop had left on a begging tour for his mission. And old brother Anthony, the factotum of the house, asked me to give him a hand when the new bed arrived. <coughs> As we removed the mattress from the old bed, we noticed something we did not immediately recognize. It was a makeshift scourge, quite evidently used. A quest of Esco, a proprio santo. I remember Brother Anthony saying, this bishop is really a saint. We placed the instrument of penance under the mattress of the new bed, and that was that. Incidentally, open in parenthesis, as I may do often during this retreat, are we doing anything or everything to exploit these marvelous figures, these magnificent men? who formed the envy of, of so many religious orders. Now I know that a great many confrères in our province wield a good pen, so we should get busy. And do not write big volumes, nobody reads them. Short pamphlets with a sparkle, but this is just a thought. I don't know how you look at these things, but a story in the end of an aspirant, of a novice particularly, a story of the life of this man is sufficient to awaken in him a tremendous desire to be like he was. We were saying that what awaits us during the retreat, in the words of Bishop Versilia, is the Lord's gift of his word, of his love, his very self. 
Do you remember the words Jesus himself said to the Samaritan woman? If you but recognize the gift of God, these words are addressed to each of us. Shall we then keep in mind the most important person, the only important person during this retreat is Jesus. The Master is here and calls you. Might well set the mood for this retreat. This is not melodrama. The Master is here. Where two or more gather in my name, I am in the midst. Jesus is here in our midst when we meet to concelebrate Mass, to pray the hours of the day, to converse on our religious and Salesian life. We will find him waiting for us in the chapel for a quiet visit. We w he will be with us when in a reflective mood we sit back in our room or take a solitary walk along the pathways of this beautiful place, hoping we have some more decent weather than we had last week. Last week. Father Binelli, our Provinces unforgettable novice master from 1921 to 1931, was a man who joined great spiritual depth to a transparent simplicity. He had a way of uncomplicating things, of going to the heart of what really mattered in the spiritual life. I remember a few days before the retreat, as we enter the study hall, written on the blackboard in his fine script-like handwriting were these words, for a fruitful and successful retreat. One. Ingredere totus, mane solus, egredere alter. One, bring all yourself into the retreat, heart and soul. Two, during the retreat, strive to remain alone, alone with Jesus. Three, come out of the retreat changed, alter another. The retreat must be a turning point in our life. If it is not, we have wasted our time. Worse, we have ignored the gift of God. Now you say, in Gratis getting completely into the retreat, Manesaurus, stay alone with Jesus. The greater I am, see that you come out of it changed. This is very elementary. Yes, but try to put it into practice. Saint Ignatius, who knew something about retreats, speaks of total surrender to the action of the Holy Spirit. It is exactly what Father Binelli's three points imply. Complete availability. Total surrender to God. Not easy. But it is the price we must be ready and willing to pay if the Lord's gift is to be ours. I was pleasantly surprised, not to say impressed, that in the evaluation of the 1980 retreats, you, confreres, asked for a more diligent observance of science. By way of comment, our very efficient retreat director, Father Vincent, added, added a few precious words. We all know, we all know, he remarks, that silence is not something that comes from an external imposition, but rather from the internal disposition of each individual. The only way we will achieve an atmosphere conducive to prayer and reflection is if each confrere disciplines himself 
not only by means of exterior silence, but also by interior silence. No comment is needed. Don Bosco was unyielding on the matter of silence during the retreat, and Don Rua was even more so. At the retreat in Balsalic, India, Turin, having noticed some laxity with regard to the silence among the compares, Don Rua said in a good night, listen, we Salesians have been criticized by other religious orders for allowing a break in the silence after lunch and after supper during the retreats. Don Bosco stood his ground on this point, wanting to have a break in the silence. We are not, he said, a monastic community. We are a family. And members of a family like to talk when they meet after months of separation. It is good for the spirit. But when it is time for silence, Don Bosco continued, we certainly mean that it be silence. And Don Rua concluded, we come to the retreat to speak, to listen to the Lord. We cheat on him. Lo derubiamo, we rob him. If we chatter away those precious hours, indulging in conversation, and to reading things not pertinent to the retreat, to God and to the soul, is not only dissipation of spirit, but a positive sign that our heart is not in the retreat. Now our tradition not to say Don Bosco's directives, are that silence be kept from rising to lunchtime, and again after the afternoon recreation until dinner. <coughs> we propose to keep it, if only in deference to Don Bosco, our founder. Father Paul Albera Don Bosco's second successor was a young deacon preparing for ordination. Those were the days when the oratory was the only house in the society. It was the end of the school year, the busiest time ever at Valdocco. Paolo Don Bosco told him, I have it all arranged for you with the good Bishop of Asti. You can make the retreat at his summer home on the hills of Monferrato. It is a delightful place. The only one that will be there will be the bishop and maybe his help. Young Aldera could not be more pleased. However, he soon found out the bishop was more company than he cared to have. Long leisurely, leisurely meals endless conversations in the garden, long walks in the countryside. After a day or two, Don Albera felt compelled to remind the good bishop that he had come to make a retreat. You don't need a retreat, the bishop replied. At the oratory, you are on retreat 365 days a year. Not so, Your Excellency, said the young deacon. Surely you must know that life at the oratory is a whirlwind of activity. A sustained dialogue with the Lord is out of question when, when you are surrounded by hundreds of youngsters and forever plagued with all kinds of problems. I see I am your problem here, replied the bishop smiling, and with a gentle tap. And Don Alba's shoulder, who am I, he said, to stand between you and the Lord? He is much better company than I. So, my dear confreres, we need an island of silence, a bit of solitude for a change. Mostly we Salesians live in a supermarket-like atmosphere. Interior silence is important, too. So let's bring down a mental curtain 
of the whirlwind of activity which we have left behind. Let's not be afraid of the desert. Israel never felt closer to God than during the years in the desert. Jesus saw deserted places in which to pray, ipses solos, all by himself, the gospel says. It is in solitude that we best seek and find the true face of our God. And it is in solitude that we really succeed to see ourselves as God sees us. We take our lady as our model and our guide. <coughs> it was in the silence of Nazareth that God spoke to her heart. St. Bernard says that it was that prayer-filled solitude, Mary, that in that prayer-filled solitude of Nazareth, that Mary developed in herself capacitas day, the ability to receive and hold God. And we do not wonder that when she finally broke her silence, St. Bernard continues, from her soul filled with God came a threefold cry, Ecce, here I am, Lord, fiat, be it done to me as you were, Lord. Magnificat, anima mea, sing to the Lord, O my soul. Would it not be wonderful if at the end of the retreat we too could cry out, Ecce, fiat, magnificat. <coughs> I hope you feel in for whatever is wanting in this first conversation with you. What matters is that we be receptive and cooperative with what is once again a loving initiative of God's grace and love for us. It is He who always makes the first move. It is He who brought us here. It is He who, in the words of St. Paul, gives us et velle et perficere, the will to act and the strength to do so. May he find us disposed, anxious actually, to receive his gift. I recall a great Salesian whose name will come frequently in the course of our conversations, Don Alberto Caviglia. He introduced the opening sermon of the retreat he preached to us students of theology at Crocetta with these words. Are we back again to our annual useless attempt to become better religious and solutions? Is this what our retreat is going to be? Another useless attempt is stopped dramatically as it could be. No, we are not. And it bellowed out and gave the mighty punch on the table. In those days the priest sat, I don't know why. I could hardly ever even begin to speak if I sat on a chair and tried to speak. While St. Augustine, less dramatically, puts it even more effectively, Time Dominum transeuntem et non revertentem, he says. The Lord comes knocking at your door. Will you not open to him? He wants to speak to you. Will you not listen to him? What, is, what if he were not to come back again, Time? How can you not be afraid? How can we not think about these things as, if, as we prepare to retire tonight? How can we not ponder them in our heart and pray, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. And we have believed in your love. Bear with me and give me just two or three more minutes. I was but a few feet away from Pope John Paul II when on April 13, 1980, in Turin for a pastoral visit, he knelt briefly before the remains of St. Joseph Cafasso, 
Dambasco's mentor and spiritual guide in the great basilica of Our Lady of Consolation. As the Holy Father left the altar of the saint after a short prayer, he said, I discovered Don Cafasso reading the life of Don Bosco. He impressed me almost as much as Don Bosco himself. Don Cafasso deserves to be better known among us, if only for a deeper appreciation of our founder. Welcoming one day a group of priests at a retreat, St. Joseph Cafasso said, I think the first duty we have to the Lord, our host in this house, is an apology. Let each of us say to him humbly, frankly, I am here again, Lord, not much better than I was a year ago, probably worse. Forgive me. I need you more than ever. I need to see myself as you see me. All I can say is, in the words of St. Augustine, Novere in me, other in me, Novere in te, amere in te, that I may know myself to realize how low I stand, and that I may know you to know how many reasons I have to love you. And so we are taking Don Cafasso's words to heart. We will spend the first day of the retreat in animo contrito et spiritu humiliato, recalling with a contrite and humble heart that all too often we have been faithless and useless servants. If possible, no, it will be possible tomorrow. We will, in fact, offer at our Eucharistic liturgy the votive mass for the forgiveness of sins. The homily will deal with our sinfulness and God's merciful and forgiving love. And through the day, let us make the remembrance of our infidelities, of our sins, the dominant theme of our conversations with our Lord. We might even find time to recite Psalm 51, Miserere, or any of the penitential psalms. We are thus set in the mood for a fruitful penitential rite, as well as for a retreat confession, at which encounter with the Lord, forgiving Lord, we will once again experience the joy of listening to him say to us, Be of good heart. Your sins are forgiven. And now we retire in peace with the joyous conviction that Jesus is truly in our midst during these days. And too with a, with a prayer on our lips, the one we offered as we opened this retreat, one of the most beautiful prayers in the new liturgy. Oh God, let the light of your Holy Spirit mercifully penetrate the dark recesses of our hearts, that we may joyfully experience your presence in us and be filled with the sweetness and strength of your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christi in Port Chester. Some of you do not know that I was there for 29 years. Father Maziero, the pastor, full of apology, 
because the room he gave me this time was not quite the kind he would have wanted to give me. And I assure you, it was comfortable and I was perfectly happy with it. But my, my confrere near me, Father Duffy, did not seem happy that I was happy <laughs> because he began to ask me to change with, to change my room, to go take his. It just happened that he had a suite, you know. He had a beautiful, beautiful place. And he said, I don't need all this room. I got two rooms here. Why do I have two rooms for? Besides, you need the telephone. You don't have a telephone in your room. I have the office downstairs. So what do I do with two rooms? I uh, totally and completely said, let's, don't do it. I come and go home. I'll be away for weeks for the retreats. You are very comfortable there. Stay there and I'm comfortable where I am. No. One day I was out for some lectures. I come home. What did he do? He moved a few things he had from his room to my room. And a few things I had in my room to that beautiful suite that had been his. And he literally pushed me inside. I said, now this is what you call marvelous. The spirit of poverty, the spirit of brotherly love, won a great victory at Corpus Christi. There you have it. But it, it's a wonderful feeling, I can assure you. And thank God we have not lost the beautiful feeling. Now, those of us who knew Father Binelli remember him best for his happy and carefree disposition. Because he was familiar with many languages, he was occasionally asked to go to the Westchester detention house to help with confessions. Once, we were near Christmas, he came home minus his overcoat, his watch, and his wallet. It was not evidently a maximum security prison. <laughs> he was very philosophical about it. He said one of those poor fellows decided to give himself a Christmas present. <laughs> it gives me a chance to practice detachment. The watch and the overcoat were eventually re recovered, but not the wallet. Well, he was a happy, wonderful man with a smile on his face and all that And this makes us think of St. Paul, who describes himself as overflowing with joy, speaking of all the privations, he numbered them. And then at the end he says, I am overflowing with joy. The truth is that hardships, the hardships of self-imposed poverty and detachment from material things cannot and do not, in fact, take the joy out of life. Not for a man whose mind and heart are fixed on the cross. We often speak about self-searching and... Um, uh, examination. I did not provide a number of questions on piety. I leave it up to you. It is again Father Benanti who at, at, at every exercise for our happy death wanted us to go over our belongings. What could we have? In our task in the little closet near our bed to see if there was anything that was useless and to get rid of it. He had a way of practically teaching us a lesson. Maybe we could do that. Look around our room and see how many useless things we have. Things that do not fit in with the spirit of the vow of poverty we have made. So you think about this. Remembering the words we read in the Constitution, each of us, is responsible for his own life of poverty, living day by day the detachment he has promised. I feel bad that 
I put too many parentheses, but let's get down with obedience. Uh, I would simply say that a discourse on obedience would hardly be necessary if we take the words of Father Alfonso literally. We quoted him this morning. With regard to obedience, there is no problem. All we need to do is obey. The fact is that obedience in our day and age poses one of the gravest problems for the religious life. Am I exaggerating? In a recent survey of 3,458 male religious communities in Europe, on the question of authority and obedience, 97.5% of the religious who replied agreed, quote, in the church, authority derives from God, but he is for the service of the community. But listen now, and don't be scandalized. Only 56% agreed the will of the superior represents the will of God. Only 56%. The other 44% claim that God manifests his will, not through the superior, but through the community. The superior's task is simply to see that the will of the community be properly implemented. There is more to this surprising survey. For centuries, the superior juridically had the right to demand obedience and expected to be obeyed. The survey indicates that 83.6% of the religious surveyed felt that the subject has the right to discuss or dispute the order of the superior. 11.5% leave to the subject, leave it to the subject to accept or refuse, and only 5.2% expect the order of the superior to be obeyed unconditionally. So evidently there are problems connected with obedience. How about us? What is the religion obedience like? And our obedience, our constitutions are a monument of balanced wisdom. After the opening article that sets the why of obedience, based on the words and the example of Jesus, whom we freely chose to follow, Article 91 is very explicit on the style of Salesian obedience. We read that too. Obedience and authority are practiced in a family among us, where relationships are inspired by a serene and mutual confidence. What Father Alfonso said, we quoted in this morning. Too many of us do not know what Salesian obedience is all about. And the same applies to the article on community obedience, that we form one community, that once something has been decided, it is for us all, not just to accept it, but to work that it be implemented in the best way. Now we say, if all Salesian superiors were like Father Lee Don Bosco, then all confreres were as observant as Don Rua, there would be no problem with constitutions like these. Unfortunately, it is not so. Don Cavilia, sharp-tongued as he was, used to say, listen, that if Don Bosco made a mistake, it was in thinking all Salesian superiors would have been like he was. Quite a statement. Incidentally, Don Camilla made this statement while preaching a retreat to directors and provincials, Director Major Don Ricaldone among them. Don Bosco did have problems but knew how to handle them with a broad mind and a big heart. Surely in your Salesian readings you have come across the name of Giacomo Costamagna, the great Salesian bishop 
who followed in the trail of God and of Galliero, not only as a missionary, but as a distinguished musician. Do you let me five more minutes, please? Would you? And then I'll cut it, and we put the next to tomorrow morning. It's a little hard here today, anyway. Listen, as a young priest, Costanaya was so in love with the oratory at Valdocco that when Don Bosco asked him to go to the school at Alasio and the Riviera to take over the music program, he squarely refused. Imagine refusing to go to Alasio and the Riviera. You should see that place. You should see it. And how far minded Don Bosco was when he bought it. He bought stretches and stretches of beach on the, uh, on the, on the shore. Unbelievable how that man looked ahead. The trouble is that following directors kept selling piece by piece <laughs> all of those beaches until now they are reduced with a sizable piece of a private beach, but nothing like the Moscow had bought. Well, anyway, Costamagna refused to go to the Riviera. He actually considered it an affront that Don Bosco, whom he loved dearly, should ask him to leave the oratory. For days he studiously avoided meeting Don Bosco. He even refused to reply to the written messages our founder slipped under his pillow in the cell in the boy's dormitory. Do you remember your own? The young ones don't know what the cells were like. One evening, Don Costamagna, in a black mood, decided to retire early. As he got to his cubby home, he was surprised to find Don Bosco. I had left the place in a mess, he said, recounting the story. The bed was unmade, books and papers strewn all over the place. And there was Don Bosco making my bed a pillow in his hand. Giacomo, he said to me, I have no one else who could take over in Alasio. You know how important the music program is. You are the man for it. The only one who could do it justice in their important school. Take it at least for a while, and I promise you'll be back here at the oratory. I was so moved and embarrassed, I grabbed a pillow from him and said, Don Bosco, how can I say no to a mother? Only my mother ever made my bed. Maybe Don Cavidia was right. Don Bosco did indeed make the mistake of thinking that all Salesian superiors would be like him. In my 56 years as a Salesian, I had some splendid directors and even provincials, but none of them ever made my bed. Don Costamania himself, I must say, and we'll stop here because it's becoming indecent now. It's way past the time. Don Costamania himself seemed not to have profited very much by the Bosco's example. All his life, even as a bishop, especially as a bishop, he was, to his own admission, an ogre, a bear. Not even Don Bosco succeeded to take. And the story that follows is unbelievable. Maybe some of you heard it. We leave it for tomorrow morning. We hope it will be a little cooler. I would be taking too much of your goodness and patience to stretch this any longer. But the talk on obedience is truly important. In the light of, the, of that survey, and it was not a survey made by this grunt of religious, but by a commission of religious, you can begin to realize at what point religious life can be reduced if it's all important now should be discounted or should be lived as, it's, as if it simply were not there. God help us and save us from such 